Inside the Tahoe, now the first thing to talk about is the cargo capacity and passenger space. Now the overall wheelbase of the current generation or new Tahoe has increased by 4% versus the prior generation truck. However, through clever packaging, specifically in the floor pan, they've managed to increase the overall cargo capacity by 30%. And more importantly, when the third row is up, the rear trunk space has increased 66%, making this genuinely usable. Now let's talk about passenger room or passenger comfort. Now if you're a breeder, the general has you covered. You can fit up to six of your spawn in this vehicle, meaning there's a total seating capacity for seven. The second row has captain's chairs. They slide manually forward and aft and they have some adjustment. However, if you equip this vehicle, you can electronically control them or fold them flat from the rear. The third row is a bench. Now, theoretically, you can fit three back there. However, I would only do that if you don't love your children. Now, let's talk about some of the fundamental differences between the Tahoe and Suburban before we talk about interior space for your knickknacks. Now, when it comes to the Suburban, the Suburban is supposed to look more stately. It is the larger vehicle. All of the extra space is behind the third row. However, your third row does get slightly more legroom at about an inch. The rest of the vehicle, when it comes to trim options, powertrain options, and trim levels are identical. The Tahoe, again, is a little smaller, and it's supposed to be the sportier vehicle because nothing says sport like a 6,000-pound SUV. Now you may be wondering, what about space for my knickknacks, Jack? Don't worry. The Tahoe has you covered. The door cards are triple stacked like your cold cuts. What I mean by that is there are three pockets. Your top pocket is for something like a wallet or some coins. Your second pocket is large enough for a smaller size water bottle or your sunglasses. And your third bottom pocket is the large one. It's big enough for all of your various knickknacks, including a liter sized bottle of water. My Nalgene bottle will fit. The center console area is flanked by two mini pockets on both sides, large enough for a pair of sunglasses. And then your center console area itself is enormous. The center cubby is triple stacked. Again, like the door cards, you have a top pocket for or top storage solution for something like a phone. When you lift this up, the cargo area is large enough for a full size purse. And then when you activate the electronically sliding armrest, yes, this electronically slides forward and aft you reveal an even larger area for your things. And this thing also has a mini hideaway glove box area, or basically a small compartment for your extremely valuable items. The other cargo solutions in this front area are this spring-loaded trap door thing that you can fit a set of sunglasses in and a cavernously large glove box. Now let's talk about seat comfort. The Tahoe does not have the sportiest of seats. And what I mean by that is you have room to grow because there are limited bolsters. Your seat bottoms essentially have no bolsters. They're basically flat. However, they are still comfortable for shorter drivers and the seat bolsters on the side are also very wide. So if you are a larger human being, way past 250 pounds, you will probably fit with no problems. And on top of that, you have a tremendous amount of headroom. My only complaint when it comes to these seats, other than the lack of bolstering for sportier driving, is the seat bottoms. They are pretty short. So again, if you have longer legs, you might find them a little bit uncomfortable. So with that, let's talk about the electronics. Let's start with Chevy MyLink. You have an all new giant display. It doesn't have the highest resolution. However, I will say the infotainment system itself is fast to react. The cameras available in this truck are tremendous. You have a 360 cam, a front facing cam, and a rear facing cam. Your individual settings are easy to navigate and the menus are great. The structure makes total sense and the way you interact with it is a series of redundant controls. So your core controls are physical like volume, track selection, and you have a rotary dial on the right side that allows you to manually scroll through all the different applications and menus. On top of that, you can also interact with it using simple touch controls. Your HVAC system, all your controls are physical, chunky, and you can use them easily with gloves. Now the gauge cluster. You have two giant analog gauges. They're easy to read. Thankfully, the center of the display as well, your five inch digital display also has all of your necessary auxiliary information like your trans temp, your water temp, your oil pressure, and your fuel economy. Last thing to talk about on this interior is the audio system. It's a Bose system. And I will say it's a 
step up from the prior generation Bose system I've listened to. And that's largely because the noise floor in this vehicle is so low. It is incredibly quiet. So with that, let's head to the shop. So Mark, we're underneath the 2021 Tahoe Z71. Now the Tahoe, Suburban, the GMC counterparts, and the Escalade are all in the same architecture. It's the T1X architecture, which is also shared with Chevy trucks. However, this architecture has given them the flexibility to add an IRS in the rear. You get independent rear suspension now in the new Tahoes and Suburbans, and a flat load floor, which allows you to have more stuff. Yeah, and that's important for something like this. And this is the biggest money maker and the most important piece of hardware for GM currently. They sell the most Silverados. I mean, by far, this is where all the money is at for them. This so platform. They, this platform. So they are not fooling around with this. So we're going to go over the, some of the technical parts of it. So let's start with the front suspension. You now get air ride and magna ride dampers. In fact, you get three different suspension options or four. The municipal vehicles, so they're what's called the tactical vehicle program or their police pursuit vehicles, get an entirely different suspension setup with passive dampers and coil springs. For cost and obviously ease of use to swap out. Yep. Your base vehicles get passive dampers and coil springs as well, which are tuned differently. Then you can get coil springs with Magna Ride dampers. For the first time, I believe, the Tahoe and Suburban now get Magna Ride. And then in the higher trim vehicles, you get Air Ride and Magna Ride. So there's a lot of added complexity there. But the reason they did that, is we'll talk about it in the rear, but it mainly has to deal with body control and towing capability. And there are some benefits to overall ride refinement when you combine air springs and Magna Ride dampers. They have a lot of flexibility in terms of tuning and leveling out suspension for handling, <laughs> given trying to manage all this weight. The front are enormous steel uh, control arms, there is aluminum in the knuckle design, but the shock absorber in the front, much like the back, the shock runs through the center of the air spring. The front has real truck pieces of equipment. Now, is this exclusive on the Z71? Yes, so the Z71, Z71 package has a exclusive front fascia. In fact, every single package or trim level of the Tahoe and Suburban has a different front end look. Okay. This has a unique fascia which has real recovery points, these two giant red tow hooks in the front, a skid plate, slightly higher ride height, and you get a series of off-road modes and a transfer case. Yeah. So there's a real low range transfer case in this. You get a limited slip differential in the rear and you get a off-road plus mode. So when you're in low range and you put this into the maximum ride height, it will raise even further than if it was in like a regular four high mode. Which is limited by speed, of course, mm -hmm. but that's the benefit of having air suspension, despite the ex the cost to buy in, the cost to repair is way higher for the air springs and the air suspension. They have to deal with leaky lines and all the maintenance. But if you're towing and you're going off-roading, there are, I mean, there's nothing else. It gives you a lot of flexibility that you wouldn't have with a passive suspension. Correct. Let's get to the back and take a look at the rear half. All right. So Mark, we made it to the rear of the Tahoe, and this is where the big story is, an IRS. So what an IRS allows you to have, or independent rear suspension, is better body control, ride isolation. It allows for the vehicle to drive more car-like, have a more nimble handling vehicle, which is what people are expecting in a family hauler, essentially. Yeah, even if it's a truck, now people expect it to ride like a traditional SUV because SUV popularity is kicked up. This has to act more like this. This allows them the ability and flexibility in tuning and suspension, no leaf springs, you have coilover design, and in this case, you don't even have the air springs separated from the shock. There's enough room in packaging to do that, which gives them way more design and kinematics. You have a traditional multi-link with trailing arm here, and when you have a, a fixed subframe, like on a car or an SUV, it has allowed them to mount the differential into the subframe instead of a live axle design. We're in a live axle design because the pumpkin or the rear differential will move around with the suspension undulation. You don't have the flexibility required to have a flat load floor like you can now in this Tahoe. Correct, because your differential moves with the suspension. So you have to accom accommodate maximum travel, which raises the load floor up, which this does not have the problem. And all the vehicles on this platform and generation gets this. And this is partly why during the drive, we're going to talk about how well it handles and how well it behaves compared to some of the previous generation products. You have to keep in perspective with this vehicle. It has to do a lot of things that regular SUVs don't, right? There is, again, the tactical vehicle program. There is the police pursuit vehicles. So it has to have that built-in modularity, day one, 
to accommodate the military, the police departments, and all the stuff they need to do with this vehicle. So the suspension architecture is entirely modular, including the electronics architecture inside the cabin. Then this vehicle has to haul a lot of people and right. things. It's got to be a something minivan, to every, yeah, yeah. It's got to be all the way from fleet to more hardcore usage, all the way up to all the way up to a full blown luxury car. And that's the the cost and development when you get into vehicles like this. You have to think about it from the start because you can't go halfway through. To, to well, at least to make a good vehicle these days, it has to be fully thought out ahead of time to do all this. And, and it has to tow on top of right. it. Right. Which, from a suspension design perspective, adds a lot of complexity. If you're too soft in the rear, you don't have the ability to firm up or level the rear ride of this vehicle, which the air ride allows, it won't be able to tow. And this tows, keep in perspective, as much as a Chevy 1500 did in the late 2000s. This thing, depending on trim level, can tow nearly 8,000 pounds. And in terms of the frame compared to the Silverado version, they did change the frame structure near the center half of the car, but the front is identical of, of, as the Silverado truck. You essentially have the same hard points for suspension and for the motor. Correct, and let's get into the motor briefly. V8 across the entire range. Yeah, other than the diesel. So right. the gas-powered offerings, this is the volume engine, the 5.3, which is in everything, and it's been modified now for this generation. They went from active fuel management, AFM, to DFM. And you also have a 10-speed torque-converted automatic, correct? Yes. It's got variable cylinder deactivation to help fuel economy if you're towing and all that. But and potentially fix some of the reliability issues. You have the 6.2, which is carried over largely from the prior generation, produces the same amount of torque as a diesel offering and more horsepower, so it should be faster, but it's only available in the top trim Tahoe and Suburban, and then you have a diesel six-cylinder variant coming out. All right, let's take this on the road and see how it drives, Jack. All right. Well, Mark, I hope your prostate's all right because there's a lot of tea in this vehicle. This is the 2021 Chevy Tahoe Z71. All right. Oh, yeah. Well, I did. <laughs> I thought there'd be a lot more testosterone in this thing, but that's not what the Z51 is about, is it? No, this this package is about going off-roading, Mark. Is it 51? 71. Oh, okay, I always get my numbers mixed up. So what are we doing? Tell me about it. So this is an interesting vehicle because it's not something you and I particularly look for, right? We don't have the need to tow a building because this tows as much as a, tr a truck, haul seven people, and carry the maximum amount of things humanly possible. So as a road vehicle, as we talked about in the shop, there's some inherent compromises. We have the 5.3. This is the basically the, the uh, volume leader of their engines. It's what's in everything. And it's, as you just felt, adequate, at least at sea level. There's enough guts to move this basically 6,000 pound cottage down the road in a effective manner. Yeah, I would agree with that. The first time I got into the Tahoe, I was completely surprised it didn't feel like a GM. And I know that's a weird kind of thing to say if you're a Chevy person, what does that mean? It feels far more refined than I expected. It's really isolated and quiet. It doesn't handle like a boat either. I mean, it's still a big vehicle, but it doesn't give you that tip over effect that you would anticipate with the, like you said, a cottage on wheels. It's surprisingly enjoyable and balanced to drive this. Yeah, I'm, I'm genuinely, I didn't think I was gonna like it. I don't like trucks, but this, it's really competent. It's not what I was expecting at all. As you mentioned, it has great ride isolation. So this is air ride and Magna ride dampers with the Z71 trim as equipped. And it's really, really impressive. It has 10% truckishness. The rest is feels just like a really refined SUV. You can hear us in here. There's not a ton of echo. The sound deadening and damping is great. You don't pick up a lot of road noise. Yes, the tires don't have a lot of grip, but that's not what, again, this is not what this is about. But the body control, thanks to the magnetic dampers, really finds a good balance between ride quality, softness, and then it firms up the dampers when they need to, to, to flatten the ride out. And overall, that's what surprised me the most, is just how livable and enjoyable this really is to driving every day, aside from the fact that it feels large. Yeah, this is a big vehicle. If you were buying this vehicle, over like a minivan or a Telluride or some of the other more passenger focused, not towing focused yeah. SUVs, 
uh, there are definitely some compromises. You need to you you need to actually require its capabilities. Otherwise, you're not the, what you're trading off is some of the maneuverability and the fuel economy. Yeah, and you definitely the, because of the towing capacity, that's the prime one of the primary reasons you would buy this. But what they've done in the back half of this is definitely uh, more usable than you would anticipate with the cat captain's chairs in the back and i know you talked about this on the interior part but it does find a great balance between utilitarian like minivan style and that classic truckish suv while still having it feels like this thing has definitely got testosterone infused it's <laughs> way more masculine than a lot of products are and i know that's what they're going for so that's going to be hit or miss but I, I know you talked about the fuel economy so this has cylinder deactivation we talked about it in the shop why is it so bad is it just the weight? Do you think? I think it's the mass and the fact that at the end of the day, you are still driving a building down the road. And yes, as we talked about in the shop, they did do some things to fix some of the aero when they went to DFM versus AFM. And the 10 speed does a good job keeping it a low RPM. But there's just so much mass behind this. And what are you getting average driving this? About 14 or 15, and that's combined. I, it shows 13, but that's again, a, it, yeah, it's unfair because yeah, this is idling and all, all the time while we're filming it. But here, let me let me demonstrate the acceleration one more time. Trans performance is really smooth. It's not jerky. It it knows they've tuned it to balance it for towing and hauling, obviously, so you don't have got a lot of gear shock. It's just a really solid feeling, smooth driving experience. Yeah, it's really, really refined. And again, if this is what you're looking for, you don't care that you don't get the world's greatest fuel economy, you don't care it's not the fastest, you are getting a lot of the truckishness that people want in a vehicle like this. It's, you know, again, fuel For account. the price yeah. and what it does, it is a huge surprise to me. And it does not feel like low rent, like this was thrown together. You could clearly tell there was a lot of development done on interior technology. And oh, surprisingly, underneath, there's there's definitely, this is a good product for Chevy. Yeah, it doesn't feel like a rental car no, or it a bargain doesn't. basement vehicle anymore. It doesn't. I'm really impressed. And the, the older Tahoe's, some of the older GM products, I think because customer demand is forcing them to pay more attention to this, and we talked about this with the engineer on the phone, people expect more of these. They want it to be a luxury car-like experience. They want it to haul and tow. They want it to be a minivan. They want it to off-road. So more money is being developed to make this a better experience. And I think it's a better truck for because of that, really. It's pushed them farther. I agree. So with that, Mark, you want to head into the final thoughts? Sounds good. All right. Final thoughts on the Chevy Tahoe. This specs out, or this one we're driving, is about 68,000. It starts around 50 and ends about at 80. And it doesn't have any real modern competition with the exception of the Ford Expedition. And this has a huge benefit of coming standard with a V8. It does change the driving experience quite a bit. And the upcoming diesel clears up some of the biggest deficiencies of this. Fuel economy, yes, driving it it's fairly normal, and if you're in any type of city environment, you're going to be getting less than 15 miles to the gallon. And if you're towing, you're going to be in the low teens. So the diesel will fix that for sure. But overall, interior, exterior, and build quality appears to be great. Fit and finish also seems to be pretty good for something like this. Paint quality looks good. Panel gaps are average. But the interior is where it really shines. Everything feels really well assembled. It's quiet, it's refined, it drives great, and when you add on things like air suspension and magnetic dampers, it takes the ride quality from kind of truck to regular SUV. The road and noise isolation is also great, so the, lo the noise floor is really low. And this is something that I would enjoy taking across country, and if I had to tow a boat or a camper, a small camper, or uh, one of my two or three LaFerraris and McLarens, I could easily do that and I wouldn't have to worry about this and you can pack a whole bunch of people in here. So thought to design, ergonomics, interior design is great. It's really, really impressive for a Chevy. And I think as we talked about in the drive, this has been forced on them. People expect more, so they're adding more and it's well implemented. Now, the question is with all of this complication, how is it gonna last? Well, 
from a new car perspective, everything looks shiny and new. So we're gonna have to see as this ages over the next three to four years, you put over 60,000 miles on how it's gonna hold up, but that's gonna be up to you to do some of that research at this point. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.